All right, let's talk about the next effect of a price ceiling, which is black markets and bribes. Okay, now first of all, let's think about what the goal is of a price ceiling. Effectively, when a government imposes a price ceiling, they're saying the market price, the equilibrium price is too high. We want to push that price down. And the effect of that, the intended effect of that is going to be push more of the surplus in this market towards the consumers and away from the producers. Okay, so if you've got QS units that are being sold in this market, then the amount of consumer surplus that you would expect to result is going to be all of this area that's below the demand curve and above the price up to this quantity of units that are being sold. They're not going to get any surplus out of this because those units the sellers aren't going to offer to them. But theoretically, what the government is trying to do is push surplus towards the, the buyers. So you get consumer surplus is that area. Producer surplus is going to be this area here below the controlled price and above the supply curve. Right? That's the way it is supposed to work. Turns out, though, under certain circumstances, this is not going to be the way the market works out, where consumers capture most of this av these available gains from trade. Okay? And to see why that is, let's think about what's going to happen under, under these circumstances where you have this shortage. So come down now to this graph. Okay? You've got QS units being sold. And at this price, all of these buyers from here to there, they're all willing to purchase at that price. Okay? But there's fewer units than, than uh, there are fewer units for sale than there are units that, that buyers want to purchase. So if you're one of these buyers who has a fairly high value, uh, you maybe don't want to stand in line waiting with these other guys who are low value, or maybe you want to make sure that you're one of the people who gets to, to purchase unit instead of one of these lower value uh, uh, buyers. So what, what could you do instead? Well, take this line at, at QS where it hits the demand curve. That's going to tell you, wherever it hits the demand curve, that tells you the willingness to pay of this last buyer for this final unit, QS, okay? Now, they're willing to pay fairly high prices, especially compared to what the, uh, the controlled price is. So what options do you have? Well, as a, as a buyer, you do have the option of, let's say, calling up the, the seller uh, and saying, listen, I understand legally you can only charge me this low price, but tell you what, I'll make you a side payment, I'll pay you some money, a bribe on the side, and then in exchange for that, when you get a shipment in, you'll make sure that I'm one of the people that you sell to at this low price, okay? So you could, what's the, the bribe amount that we would expect the, the buyers to end up uh, offering to the sellers? Well, it's going to be an amount equal to the difference between their willingness to pay and the price that they are being charged or the price they're allowed to be charged on the market. Okay, so the length of this, length, this segment here would show you the, the bribe that's being offered per unit. Okay, that's one possibility. Another possibility is the sellers don't even wait for the buyers to make those, uh, those bribes to them. Instead, they could refuse to put these goods on their shelves when they, when they come into stock and instead sell them on the black market, right? Take them out to a, a back alley, take them to some other location where they're not officially selling. But the price they charge you on the black market is not down here. The price that they're going to charge you is the maximum price they could charge, which is going to be up here. You take those quantity of units, wherever that, that quantity hits the, the willingness to pay, they're going to charge that price, right? Because the sellers want to make as much money as they, they possibly can as well. So this willingness to pay on unit QS, that is going to be either the black market price or it's going to be the, um, the controlled price plus the bribe that you have to pay the seller in order to be the one who's purchasing the unit. 
okay? So this competition among buyers can result in black markets and bribes. And what would happen then? Well, now the price that the buyers are paying, are paying isn't down here at P-bar, it's up here at this willingness to pay. So that consumer surplus actually ends up being this smaller triangle here. And the producers capture not just what you expected them to, they also capture this whole area, this rectangle in the middle, right? This is all captured through bribes and black market, okay? Now note the irony here. You, uh, the, not you, the government sets up a regime where they're trying to make the prices lower to the consumers, okay? But in doing that, it's possible that the shortage they create actually ends up in a situation where the buyers are paying a higher price than they would have. Notice that the equilibrium price is down here. But once you factor in the bribes that are getting paid and the black market prices, the price that the final price to the buyers can actually be higher than it would have been in equilibrium, okay? Which is kind of a bitter irony. Now, whether or not this is gonna happen is gonna depend a lot on, on kind of the social norms and the rule of law of that country. The United States is a, a relatively uncorrupt country. Black markets, bribes, those are probably not the first thing that's gonna happen in a country like the United States. Similarly, if you were to go to Canada and New Zealand, Australia, a lot of Western European countries, they're not going to have massive black markets uh, and a lot of bribes. But in a number of countries, if you go to say Greece or Italy or uh, quite a few countries in say Africa or South America, some in East Asia, black markets and bribery is already fairly common. Okay, and so imposing price controls in those, uh, those areas uh, is going to result in more of this kind of activity. Also, even though we don't see a lot of black markets in the United States, it's important to note that they do still exist. I mean, you know, the, the market for narcotics, for example, is a black market that's, uh, that's doing uh, gangbusters business in the United States. And um, in some jurisdictions, New York City, for example, taxes are so high on cigarettes that oftentimes people will sell loose cigarettes. Sometimes they're called Lucy's. Uh, they'll sell them on the street at a price that is less than what you'd get charged in the store because they're selling it without the tax uh, when they sell it uh, on the street. So they, they buy the cigarettes in large cartons in say South Carolina or Virginia where the tax is relatively low, take it up to New York City where uh, when the tax is, uh, is included, the price is very high, and then they sell those, uh, those loose cigarettes at a profit, okay? And I'm not sure if you guys remember that, but there was a case in New York City, I wanna say three or four years ago, there was a young man named Eric Garner. He was a black man who was um, selling loose cigarettes on the street, uh, along with other stuff. Police were uh, trying to shut down his operation, and they ended up choking him out and uh, uh, killing him, ultimately. He, he died in the hospital a couple hours after uh, his encounter with the police. You can actually watch that, uh, that video online uh, if you just look it up on YouTube, okay? So black markets do exist in the United States and in uh, you know, westernized countries, although they're not as common as they are in, uh, in a lot of other countries. So next we're gonna move on to, um, let's see, the next effect of price ceilings which is uh, search costs and waiting in line.